Anatan, thank you very much for that extensive overview uh, on glaucoma, the problems of glaucoma, the problems that patients face, and um, the issues of using new technology to aid patients understand their disease and perhaps become more involved in their own personal care. I have no doubt that our uh, members and supporters will want to ask you questions. So I do hope you'll stay on and join uh, Dr. Rajiv Bindlish's team, the question and answer panel. Um, this panel generally will take any questions on glaucoma. And of course, any specific questions related to your talk will be directed towards you. So again, many, many thanks and good luck with your research project. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Rajiv Bindlish and his Q&A panel. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Graham, for the uh, introduction. Um, so uh, thank you, Anatin. That was a wonderful lecture, very informative. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, also, thank you to our uh, supporters for uh, tuning into the uh, annual supporters meeting. Thank you for your support. Uh, it is really greatly appreciated. And as you can see, it helps fund projects like uh, Anatin's um, to help uh, better find uh, obviously cures and treatments and, and better manage glaucoma for our patients. Uh, I'd like to introduce the rest of our panel. Um, Anatin, you've already met. Um, Katie Burt, uh, who is up at Sunnybrook Hospital. She's a well-known glaucoma specialist in the Toronto area. Um, I'd also like to uh, congratulate Katie. She's been promoted to full professor at the University of Toronto. And I think that's a excellent, a great achievement. So congratulations, Katie. And finally, to our new board member, uh, Cindy Hutnick, uh, who's been a glaucoma specialist in southwestern Ontario and uh, at London in the IVI Institute. And uh, Cindy is also a full professor of ophthalmology and has done uh, a wonderful amount of research on glaucoma. So welcome to the panel. And so we have 11 questions so far that have come in. A few have been directed uh, to uh, Anatin. And uh, so the first question, Anatin, is do you see a home use for VR uh, in glaucoma patients? Um, thanks, Raj. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there's the role for perimetry, which is for home-based screening. Um, and that's already been used as well anyway, that we can actually use the VR to test the people's visual fields at home. Um, and that sort of helps in terms of, you don't have to come to the hospital to have your measurements done. And you can actually do serial measurements over time to actually see whether your disease is progressing. There is a role for that, um, using it at home. Okay, thank you, Anatin. So uh, another question for Anatin. Um, can VR be used to determine if a patient should keep or give up their driver's license? Um, if we're looking at it in terms of uh, visual field measurement, then you can actually use that to determine whether they're able to drive or not. The test that are, the studies that have shown, have shown the test in people navigating through, driving um, through um, obstacles and driving through the city line, it can actually show people um, if they are able to drive or not, like, being exposed to that experiment, to that um, study. One of the things in our study is that we're going to be exposing patients, uh, people who have no visual field defect at all to that, ex to that experience. Um, we can also have patients who have a different kind of field test or already have some form of glaucoma go through that as well. And they can actually see for themselves whether they're able to drive or not. So it sort of helps the patients in understanding their own condition as well and their own limitations. Thank you, Anson. So just to clarify, just for the general population, so we currently do not use VR to actually test you um, and we can't use VR uh, to obviously say, hey, you don't meet the requirements to drive. That is a separate um, done through the government and that's got some strict criteria based on your vision and your peripheral vision. Uh, however, this is technology that, I mean, sometimes patients ask, uh, do I, am I safe to drive? And this might actually um, 
educate patients as to whether they are truly safe to drive or not. So I think it, it it's a promising uh, treatment coming up. Um, a question came up through your talk, Anitin, but I'm going to direct this one to, um, to Cindy. Uh, what do you mean by non-medical means of reducing IOP? Uh, what might they be? So Sydney, can you answer that one? You know, that's a tricky question. And there's a lot of speculation about some other methods that may help. Um, generally, our only known modifiable risk factor to treat interocular pressure are the medications and the surgeries. But there are some smaller studies that have suggested maybe some lifestyle changes that could be beneficial. Um, avoiding certain things tends to be more helpful than adding certain things, but we've all heard about the potential role of marijuana, and I think Dr. Burt has done some excellent research in that area. Um, staying away from certain things that could elevate your interocular pressure, such as tight collars around the necks, certain types of exercise. There really hasn't been any scientifically proven way to lower your interocular pressure consistently other than our standard technologies but there have been some indirect, non-medicinal, sometimes um, herbs that have been suggested, but in general, nothing that's really gone through the rigor of what are called um, prospective multi-center randomized clinical trials and things which have been approved by Health Canada. So whether or not they're safe, you always have to make sure that you run these things by your family doctor, because some of these um, non-medicinal um, types of treatments that may be even considered complementary medicine could have some side effects or complications that um, you may not want. So yes, there are some components of cannabis which may lower your interocular pressure, but then the recent um, literature has suggested there may be some components which may elevate your interocular pressure. So the research is certainly not as rigorous as some of the more standard technologies but there are lifestyle changes that may be helpful. And the bottom line is there's really no magic way. And at present, the most, um, the, the one method that you can depend upon most is by lowering your interocular pressure through the standard techniques that are recommended by your ophthalmologist. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, again, another question. There was a lot of questions on VR and it's in, so you have really, um, sort of piqued the interest of our supporters. Can a glaucoma patient use VR to learn to overcome their deficits of vision and maintain a normal life? Um, what we do know is that, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, what we do know is, oh, sorry. Um, Oh, sorry, that, sorry about that. Uh, what we do know is that um, we can use VR in a way to, for you to show what your current, what your state of the vision is at this point in time. And you can then you see how you can adapt your vision to make you more functional. I talked about changes in, your, in the gaze and changes in the, um, high movements. People have over time adjusted their eye movements and their gaze to be able to, 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 to use the little vision that they have for them to be, to, to be a functional member of the society. And that's, that's what the hope that the VR provides for you. Uh, and I think that's something that we can look forward to. Okay, thank you, Anitin. Did I answer um, the question? <laughs> it's a hard question to answer, and uh, I mean, you, I think you've done your best uh, to do that. Uh, here's a question for Katie: uh, How can I limit redness around my eyes from using uh, eye drop medications? Uh, a good question, a fairly common question, and uh, no real sort of magic bullet answer here either. Um, if the redness is too bad, you might need to discuss a change in medication options with your ophthalmologist. Um, sometimes something can be substituted, which is uh, a little better suited to, uh, to your skin. Um, trying to avoid allowing the drops to get onto the skin may be helpful. 
So um, dabbing the eyes dry from the outside once the drops go in. Um, you don't want to let the tissue soak the drop out of the eye, but you try and keep it off the eyelids and lashes. Sometimes if the skin around is getting a little affected, um, putting a thin layer of Vaseline on the skin before the eye drop goes in so it, it doesn't stick on the skin, it'll just roll off, might be helpful. And generally good health of the eyelids and lash tissue is a good idea. So warm compresses once or twice a day uh, help to improve blood flow to, to, to keep the, um, the glands in the eyelid working better so that the quality of the tear film produced by those glands is, is more normal and that helps to protect the, uh, protect the eye and also to keep um, dried up eye drops, dried up tears, uh, mucus and salt crystals from um, collecting on the eyelids, uh, which then forms a, an area of irritation and possibly even for infection. Okay, thank you, Katie. Uh, again, another VR question for Eniton. Do VR simulations show what happens to patients in general, or is it specific to the person using the VR device? The advantage of the VR is that you can show different situations. So if they don't have any defect, you can show them that they don't have any defect because then as they navigate through the different scenarios, they will notice that they have no defect. Similarly, if we can also simulate a patient with moderate glaucoma, we can simulate a patient with advanced glaucoma. We can also simulate a patient with a stroke. So anybody who is normal can actually visualize that. Even if you're in the early stages of your disease, we can also show you what the, um, what this what you will be like if you stop using your medication and you progress to a severe glaucoma, what your, what your field of vision will be like. So anybody can actually experience that. Our experience that even if you've had some defects as well, you can also see that, oh, these are the limitations that you have from those, uh, from, from, from the um, advanced glaucoma that you have. So anybody, any patient can experience that. Okay, thank you, Aniton. Uh, so I'm going to pose two quick questions to Cindy. Um, one, I hope will just be very quick. Can I use artificial teardrops with glaucoma? And then the second is a question on ginkgo. And um, uh, uh, can is it safe to use uh, ginkgo uh, with people with glaucoma? Okay, thank you. Those are both great questions. And my answer to the artificial tears follows from what Dr. Bird has said. More than 50% of people with glaucoma likely have something called ocular surface disease or dry eye. In fact, one of them, there's four common things that happen to our eyes as we age. And I think dry eye and an unstable tear film are very common. So yes, you can use artificial tears, but the key is not to use them too close together because even two glaucoma drops that are put in back to back could wash each other out and dilute the effect. There have been research studies that have been shown that it takes a really um, good five minutes for one eye drop to sink in. And if you want the full effect of the second eye drop to wait five minutes later, even if you space the eye drops out by just two minutes, you're already diluting the effect of the first eye drop. So I think the key is yes, artificial tears are a great idea, um, because many people over the age of 50 have a dry eye, which is uncomfortable. Um, but again, not to space them too close together. That's the key. But otherwise, um, there's really no contraindication to use an artificial tear with glaucoma. Um, the second question, Ginkgo Bolivar, almost follows from my first um, answer. It's considered a complementary medicine. It's not really been gone through the same rigor of the scientific trials that many of the approved drugs are. It's a drug that is thought to perhaps increase blood flow and can have side effects of thinning out your blood. So just because something is a complementary medicine, it doesn't necessarily mean it's safer. So you have to make sure you run it by your family doctor. And again, um, will increase blood flow to the eye help with glaucoma? I think my answer to that question is maybe. Some of the evidence suggests maybe. Maybe for some patients, but not other patients. Um, very quickly, there was a um, recent study that arose from what's called the United Kingdom Biobank. And it was really interesting um, study that looked at people's DNA, these 23andMe, 
and found that certain patients which expressed certain genes were more likely to be more sensitive to things like Ecobolova or caffeine. So it, it's, it's really complicated. And in some patients, what may be yes, maybe no. But bottom line, ginkgo may help. Some evidence to support it, but it's not the strongest evidence. Always run it by your family doctor before you start anything. Okay, thank you, Cindy, for that question. Um, here's a question for Katie. Are endurance sports such as long distance running or cycling permissible for glaucoma patients? I'd say generally, yes. Um, in advanced glaucoma, we will usually recommend against resistance training, heavy weights, um, anything that, that really increases uh, pressure through the body, through the neck, up into the eyes. Um, but cardiovascular training and endurance training um, may promote ocular health, promote blood flow to the optic nerve and, and be in some ways beneficial. I think the, the value of cardiovascular health overall probably outweighs any um, possible it, it's a deleterious effect on the eye. But generally speaking, the overall impression is that aerobic exercise is, is a good choice. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, I'll pose out two more questions. Uh, one more back to Eniton, which is a little bit of a two-pronged, so two questions. One, could VR replace current visual field tests? And I guess the second question is, is where do you see the VR technology having its most use in the next two to five years? Yeah, thanks, Raj. Those are two very nice questions. Um, I think we've already seen that we're using VR technology for peripheral um, perimetry. That is, that's um, one that's been developed from Toronto, the University of Toronto, uh, that is already being used. Um, and I think there's also some that are also being used as well um, in other parts of the world. So. VR is currently being used for, um, for perimetry. And there is the opportunity there for, um, for treating for rehabilitation. So as you also know, there's that study that's been done with patients with retinitis pigmentosa um, that's using VR technology for, 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 re, for rehabilitating those patients. Uh, and I think, that's an opportunity for us with glaucoma to use for our patients with advanced um, glaucoma and visual field loss or functional loss. Um, I think the, 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 the opportunity is there and the, the, it's, it's, it has a whole wide of applications that I think in the next three, five years, we should be seeing some of it um, um, being used in our clinics as well. Okay, thank you, Edmonton. Uh, our last question for the evening, uh, I'll give this to Katie. Uh, is there any promising research being done on repairing a damaged optic nerve as a result of glaucoma? I think there's a lot of research being done. I'm not sure that anything has got to the stage of being considered quite promising. Um, uh, the large research meetings that I've generally gone to the last couple of years have been, for some reason, a little bit less accessible. So if maybe Cindy, in fact, keeps her finger on the pulse of research uh, very nicely, might know something. But uh, generally speaking, the difficulty of repairing or regrowing an optic nerve is about the same scale as trying to repair or regrow a broken spine or a broken neck. So there's, there'll be, if progress in one field might easily lead to progress in ours, uh, but I don't think it's anything that's gonna be practical uh, within the short term, and sadly, possibly not even during the balance of our careers. Cindy, just very quickly. Yeah, my little plug here is that that's exactly why we have the Glaucoma Research Society of Canada. I know some of the grants that have been funded are actually looking at translational studies where they're looking at nerve tissue in the laboratory and, and um, testing strategies that may improve um, the function. So yes, Katie's right. Nothing maybe tomorrow that will be here, but there's a lot of studies suggesting that it may be possible one day. And this is exactly why we need the support to support additional research that will help us unlock some of those mysteries. 
Okay, thank you, Katie and Cindy. Um, we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, there were just a couple of other quick questions which I'll just kind of address uh, as a housekeeping. Yes, these, uh, the presentation for this evening has been recorded. It will be posted on our website uh, and a link will be shared with you and you can then in turn share this with your families. Um, Anatin, you piqued a lot of interest with uh, VR um, and uh, I mean, there's still about three or four VR questions here. Um, congratulations. It was a, a great presentation, a great study. Um, to people out there with your questions, um, in terms of wanting to be a volunteer, um, ask your ophthalmologist if he can put you in touch with somebody if you'd like to volunteer. Um, you mean VR is, the, is, a, is a realm of the future and it will be shared with patients, educators, hopefully soon. Uh, hopefully when it becomes a little bit more real time and uh, it, it may take a little bit of learning if you have an interest in VR out there. Um, hopefully if you have uh, some kids who use the Sony PlayStation or uh, Xbox, maybe they can share their VR unit with you and uh, you can um, uh, get a little bit of a taste of what VR is all about. Okay, so we're going to wrap up the question and answer. Thanks to our panel and thank you to uh, the participants for sending in the questions. And until next year, and you can always send in your questions and hopefully I will do a good job at answering them uh, through our website. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Rob. Good night.